the, um, uh, the probabilities of solutions x given the prior and, and the errors. Right? And so then you just find the maximum of that probability distribution. Right? Um, so that's the one that's kind of most probable, the maximum likelihood um, of, of that distribution. Then um, that's called the map estimate. So in a way, if you're just going to pick one from this probability distribution, that's the sensible one to pick. So the, the details of that I, I'll refer to in a handout for an undergrad course we used to teach. Um, but the thing I'm trying to say is, on the one hand, people invent Tikhonov regularization just as a kind of fudge. You know, almost A transpose A isn't invertible. Let's add a bit of something else to it. You know. Or, or let's, let's add a penalty term to the data. But it has a statistical interpretation that's much more solid that tells you that this L transpose L is related to, it's, well, it's the inverse of a covariance matrix of the probabilities of, of images that you have in mind. And, and of course, instead of just guessing that, suppose you, had, you were doing medical imaging and you had a kind of atlas of anatomies of people and you, you, know, you took that as a, a sample from a probability distribution, you could calculate its, its covariance, and then, then you'd have a kind of sensible version of this. Now, I've not seen anyone do that in medical IT, but, but in other areas, they, they do actually do that. So, um, uh, an advantage of this probabilistic approach is that you can more clearly say what the assumptions behind ticket of regularization are. So, so you, you actually choose which solution you get depending on the choice of L and alpha, alpha. That seems a little bit dodgy. You know, you can choose the answer to suit you. But if you have some rationale for understanding what those choices of alpha and L mean, um, then at least you can say, well, that, that's a limitation of, of the way we're reconstructing this image. Okay, so... Um, as a, as a kind of overview, the, the sort of default approach to doing EIT in, in medicine or geophysics is to calculate your Jacobian matrix, from the method I've just outlined, choose a nice simple L, probably you've solved the forward problem using finite elements, that's how you calculate Jacobian. Um, if you're only going to do one linear step, you can possibly use an analytical solution for the first step, assuming homogeneous conductivity. And, and certainly in geophysics, that's, that's pretty common. Um, you update the conductivity. If you want to do another step, recalculate the forward problem solution, compare the voltages again, update the conductivity again, you have to recalculate the Jacobian and then resolve this system. Okay, so, so you can think of that as regularised version of Newton's method, where you, you solve the regularised problem at each linear step. Okay, so that, that's, you know, so you can almost get started with EIT with that information, but um, I want to say a little bit more about linear ill-post problems, linear inverse problems. Um, so, of course, our EIT problem is non-linear, but we can treat steps in the problem as linear. And... Um, to study a linear ill post problem, one of the best tools to use, sort of often the first thing you look at, is called the singular value decomposition. So this is an extension of eigenvalues and eigenvectors to a non-square matrix. So let me just run through that. Um, in, in the end, it, it's easy to calculate because you have MATLAB or other function libraries in other languages to calculate the SVD, so it's the properties of it that we're interested in. So the idea is that we have a non-square matrix A, and we have a system of vectors. I'll use the traditional letters even though it conflicts with, with EIT. So rather than eigenvalues, where you'd have AU equals lambda U, we have two systems of orthogonal vectors ui's and vi's, and these things called singular values, sigma i. Um, and we also have something going the other way, that a transpose 
qi a sigma i vi. And then we also have the, um, the, the dot product. So, so it's traditional called singular values sigma. Um, right, so they look a bit like eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Indeed, if you if you say a transpose a u i, then it's simply sigma i squared u i, and a a transpose just for kind of symmetry. So in fact, these are symmetric matrices, and the, the UIs are the orthogonal eigenvectors of A transpose A, and the VIs are the orthogonal eigenvectors of A A transpose. And so if you know about eigenvectors and eigenvalues, you already know that that works. Um, the thing um, that um, well, you have to do a little bit more checking is that you can arrange for the a, V to be sigma I, U, and, and, and vice versa, this one. So, you can take that from trusting, so you can leave that for the moment. Um, but the, the point is that if, if A is the forward problem, then you can express the, the unknown, the image, in our case, in terms of an orthogonal family of functions, and you can express the data, in our case the voltages, in an orthogonal family of functions. Well, I guess if we've got electrodes, they actually are just vectors. And, and what this tells you is that the, if you put in the i-th component here, then that comes out multiplied by a number sigma i. And it's, these sigma i can be chosen to be non-negative, and it's convenient to write them in decreasing order. So, what this means is that the components with VI of the image are listed in order of how hard they are to find. Right? So, the first component, maybe that sort of constants or some kind of low frequency, has quite a big singular value, and that gives you a big singular vector, so that component's easy to find. Some of them, have very, very small singular values, and so give you hardly anything in the voltage. So those, the, the EIT system is very insensitive to changes in those components. And you ought to typically think of those as involving high spatial frequencies, and maybe also stuff in the middle is harder to find. So if you use this as Jacobian matrix, and you, you plotted these, you'd see that they look like orthogonal functions, a bit like spherical harmonics, but as the singular value goes down, these get the higher frequency. So it's a very useful tool in understanding an ill-posed uh, inverse problem. You discretize it to make it a matrix, and you look at uh, how quickly these singular values decrease. Because um, if you can only measure this to a certain accuracy, say 0.1%, then uh, as a rough guide, um, when the ratio of um, the singular values to sigma 1 falls by 0 0.001, then those components are simply rubbish. There's really no point in finding those components. So, um, of course, ticking off regularization is one way to do that, but the singular value decomposition gives you another way to do it, which I'll, I'll explain in a moment. But first, once you've got these U's and V's, you can assemble them into a matrix. And uh, perhaps I should take, say, A is in... Which way round is it? Did I say N by N? N, N by N. N by N. No, N, N by N. We've got a call. We've got a call, so it's not the same. look different still. Right, so... Um, so the data is, is in Rn, right? So um, U, it, sorry, the data is in Rm, 
and the uh, unknown is in Rn. So these u's are on the data side, so their vectors in Rm, and there'll be m of them, and similarly v. will be n of those, and these matrices are square, they're also um, orthogonal, so u transpose u is equal to the identity, v transpose v is equal to the identity. And uh, the, the neat thing then, perhaps this is actually a singular value for decomposition, is that a u is equal to v v um, usually called capital sigma, where capital sigma is a matrix which is the same shape as A, so it's um, N there, and N there, and down the diagonal it's got sigma 1 down to sigma N, and zero is elsewhere. Let's, let's just check what's going on here. Oh, I've done it all the way around. I can always do that. I, I'm trying to make the U and the V agreed with MATLAB. Like, it's because AU, because lambda U is what you for symmetric way. So each of these columns is a vector VI, and the AVI is a sigma I UI. And if you multiply by a diagonal matrix on the right, it multiplies the columns by those numbers. Get the other side, it multiplies the rows. So each of those Vs being multiplied by, it gives you sigma i, ui. 